Father, again, thank you for the blessings that are ours in Christ. May you use your word to open up our hearts to challenge us and encourage us today with your truth and with the reality and our purpose in your kingdom for the glory of Christ and in his name. Amen. Amen. I don't think that any of us uh, would doubt the fact that uh, the Apostle Paul was a man of action. A man of action. Uh, even though, as we've seen through our study in the book of Acts, and we've been going through the book of Acts, and that's where we're at this morning. We are in Acts chapter 21. Throughout this portion, as we've looked at the travels of the Apostle Paul, we've seen uh, these continual attacks that were coming against him, not only coming against Paul personally, but also coming against the message of the gospel. Even though there were times where his very life was in danger, and even though there were times that uh, he himself had, had fear, we've seen that already, we're actually going to see it a little bit further as we get into the uh, passages uh, where we're at right now. Whenever you think about the Apostle Paul, you need to understand Understand. He was a man of action, and he was set upon doing the work that God had called him to do. There was no backing down from the Apostle Paul. There was no hesitation. Paul knew what God wanted him to do, and so he continued to move forward. And I don't care what kind of a pedestal you try to put Paul on, he would not want to be on a pedestal because he was flesh and blood just like you and I. As a matter of fact, it could be said of him just like we say of Elijah, that uh, uh, just as Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, or as one version says, he was a man of like nature as we are, Paul was the same way. He dealt with issues within his life. He dealt with fear. He dealt with finding the Lord's direction, uh, misreading the Lord at times, and being reconnected or redirected by the Lord. All of these things we find in the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. What I want to keep in front of you, though, this morning is the fact that all that God was doing in and through the Apostle Paul, you need to realize Paul was not a superhero. He would have never have made it as one of the Fantastic Four, okay? He would have never been invited to become one of the Avengers because Paul had no superpowers, but he knew the one who was the power over all creation. And it's in his relationship with Jesus Christ that God was able to use Paul in a mighty way. We've gone through the, the book of Acts. We saw last week how Paul had met with the elders from the church in Ephesus, but he met them not in Ephesus. He met them in a city about 30 miles away from Ephesus, the city of Miletus. He, there in Miletus, he let them know that he was on his way to Jerusalem, and he wanted to stop to give these elders a word of encouragement, a, a word of warning. And in the middle of that warning, in the middle of those words that he was sharing with them, he also gave them some very sobering words. If you've got your Bible with you this morning, turn to Acts chapter 20. We're going to back up a little bit. Not 21, that's where we'll be in a moment. But in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 22, we read, as Paul is talking to these elders, he says, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulation await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. You see, Paul never expected to be a superhero. He didn't want to be on a pedestal. He simply wanted to be found faithful to the Lord Jesus and to the call that was on his life. He didn't know all the minute details that God had for him and what God was working for him. He was going, in essence, one step at a time. Again, opening up his heart, opening up his life to the direction of the Holy Spirit. He was determined to be found faithful to the end. So with that idea in mind, 
Let's go on into chapter 21 of the book of Acts. Now it came to pass that when we, that's Paul and his traveling companions, and remember we spoke last week that that we, that personal pronoun we, has now brought us with the understanding that Luke is now with them, the author of the book of Acts. came to pass that when we had departed from them, and the them there are the elders of Ephesus that he was meeting with there and Miletus, we set sail. And as they set sail from Miletus, it says, we ran a straight course and we came to Cos. Cos is an island south of Miletus that uh, they would have landed at first. The following day then, they went to Rhodes. And then from there, they went to the coastal town of Patara. And finding a sailing ship over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. Now, Phoenicia was actually an area of land along the coastline of Syria. It's in the area of modern-day uh, Lebanon for you and I to kind of give you an idea where it is. Uh, they, they found this ship. It was going in the right direction. Their intended uh, port was going to be there in Tyre. Tyre, again, a coastal city where they were going to be landing, but that was still a good piece north of where they wanted to be. They wanted to work their way to Jerusalem. But again, this ship apparently had the right timing, good for their schedule. They left the port at Patera. The, uh, Luke continues to give us a pretty clear uh, description of the direction that they were going down in verse 3. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, we sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And again, this, the, the sailing from Patera to Tyre could have taken as much as a week, depending upon the winds, depending upon the season. Uh, the island of Cyprus, pretty major island there in the Mediterranean. Luke says we saw that it passed to our left as we continued on to the coastline of Syria or the area of Phoenicia. As they waited there in Tyre, as the ship landed in Tyre and unloaded its cargo, Paul and the others, they found a group of believers there in the city or the town of Tyre. Most likely they were Gentile believers, uh, since no mention is given of any kind of a synagogue or uh, any kind of a connection with, with Jews at that point in time. As they met these believers, Luke tells us they stayed there for about seven days. Look at verse 4. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with their wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and we prayed. And when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. So once again, Paul is warned by the Spirit Again, that there's going to be danger for him once he gets to Jerusalem. The wording there that we find in verse 4 has caused a lot to speculate that the Spirit was trying to tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem. No, you go to Jerusalem, it's going to be troubles. It's going to be problems. I don't believe that that's the case. I believe that what the case was, the Spirit was telling all of these individuals that this brother of yours is moving forward into danger and you really need to be praying for him. Yes, as a warning to Paul, but not as a redirection. Paul was led by the Spirit of God to go to Jerusalem. Just as we read earlier on up in chapter 20 in verse 21, he says that I am bound in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Paul understood that God had a purpose for his going. I believe that Paul also knew that there was going to be a personal cost that he was going to have to pay. When he had finished their voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemus, verse 7 tells us. And we greeted the brethren, we stayed with them one day. That's down at the very south end of the area of Phoenicia. Verse 8 says that on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and we came to Caesarea. And we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. And we stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. If you remember back earlier in uh, the chapters of the book of Acts, back in chapter 6, we, well, that's when we first met 
Philip. Philip was one of the seven that the church had appointed to take care of some of the physical needs within the church, in particularly the, the feeding of the widows to make sure that the distribution of the food was balanced between the Hellenistic widows and the other Jewish widows. That was Philip was one of those. Philip was also the one that the Holy Spirit caught up away and sent him to Gaza, the, the desert road that uh, led to Gaza, and that's where he met that uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And remember, he ran alongside the, the chariot and asked him what's, what he's reading, and the, he got up on the chariot and led that Ethiopian eunuch to Christ through the Old Testament scriptures by sharing with him the truth of what Isaiah speaks. Uh, we find out then that from that point, after he baptized that Ethiopian eunuch, that the Spirit <clears throat> literally, excuse me, <clears throat> after that we find out that the Holy Spirit literally took him away from that area, and he ends up in Caesarea. And now he has been in Caesarea for about 20 years. He's married, and as Luke shared with us, he now has four daughters, at least four daughters. Those four daughters have the gift of prophecy. It's interesting to note that although Luke tells us about the daughters and their gift of prophecy, he doesn't mention any words that these daughters might have shared to Paul or to the group at all. Uh, he just doesn't have it there, but that's where they're at, at the house of Philip. After several days at Philip's house, though, the Lord brings another man onto the scene, a man by the name of Agabus. And we read about Agabus earlier on in, in the book of Acts in chapter 11, that uh, in those days prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So no doubt the Lord had his hand on our brother Agabus, and now he has led him to come to Caesarea. He's led him to the house of Philip. And so back in Acts 21, down in verse 10, we read that as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt and he bound his own hands and his feet and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when they heard these things, both we, Luke is writing here, we, the, those that had been following with Paul, we and those from that place, Philip and his household and the others there, we, from the, uh, all of us, pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then verse 13, then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord. And so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. Over and over, that message had come. Confirmation after confirmation had been declared to Paul that once he got to Jerusalem, he was going to be uh, arrested, imprisoned, or even worse. Guys, throughout all of this, I see working in this, I believe, a doctrinal truth that's being laid out for us that unfortunately many, even today in the Christian community, totally ignore or they disregard. And I believe that they do it to their own hurt. That doctrinal truth I'm speaking about is what we see in the life of Paul here. That being a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ does not shield you from times of trouble, conflict, or even times of absolute devastation. Now you see, there's many in the church today that teach absolutely the opposite. Oh, if you have enough faith, if you are righteous and good enough, then you'll never have a problem in this world. And everything will be, uh, started to say hunky-dory, but that's kind of an old statement. Everything will be great, okay? 
show my age real quick. But if you just have enough faith, if you, if, you, if you were living your life right, none of these things would happen to you. Beloved, I, how many of you know that Paul had faith? How many of you know that Paul was living his life as, as right as he possibly to, could to the glory of God? And yet all of these things came upon him. The faithfulness of a disciple of Jesus Christ does not necessarily guard them from the attacks of the enemy. But there's another truth that you need to understand along with this. It does give you a strong foundation that allows you to be able to have strength during the storms of life. Your faithfulness to Christ, your obedience to His Word, the strength of your faith in him is what gives you the ability to weather those storms as the Holy Spirit surrounds you and keeps you. He will either lift you up and over the storm, bring you around the storm, or there is that assurance and promise that he is with you even in the midst of the storm. The Holy Spirit continued to, I believe, form that doctrinal truth in the Apostle Paul's mind and his spirit through every incident that happened to him. Some years later, the Apostle Paul will write to young Timothy. Timothy the pastor, Timothy the protege of the Apostle Paul. Timothy, uh, again, uh, uh, a great friend, a close uh, co-worker with Paul. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy. He writes to him, Timothy, you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my suffering, and my love. You've also carefully followed my perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me, and what persecutions I endured. And yet, out of all, the Lord delivered me. You say, now wait a minute, the Lord delivered him? Does that mean he didn't have persecutions? No, think for a moment. He says, look at verse 12. He says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. What Paul is saying there is when our hearts and our minds are stayed on Christ, when the foundation of our life is firmly set on the reality and the truth of God's Word, and we are finding ourselves walking in obedience, seeking, again, the leading of the Holy Spirit. The enemy is going to do everything that he can to dissuade us, to distract us, to discourage us from following Christ, from being obedient. And the Lord delivered him from all of that. All of that of falling away because he remained faithful to Christ, to the leading of the Holy Spirit through all of his persecutions, through all of his afflictions, through everything that happened to him. He remained faithful. That truth had already been formed in Paul's mind. He was now in the process of walking out his belief, living out the doctrines that he knew to be true. That again, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I think that anyone who has been a believer for, for even the shortest of while, you understand this continual tension that's going on. That tension to remain faithful and strong even when life seems to be either falling apart all around you or there is this continual attack from every side. Question is, is how do you stay strong in the midst of future battles? How do you stay strong in the midst of future battles? I believe the word is very clear. By being faithful and obedient in this present hour. It's when you and I are walking in obedience this present hour that our strength is being built up. Our faith is being strengthened. Our trust in God in every issue is being strengthened. So many scriptures remind us that we need to be found faithful and obedient in times of blessing so that when that battle comes, we can stand strong against the attack of the enemy. Guys, there's not an army in the world that has ever survived that hadn't taken the time for training and preparation during times of peace. 
You don't go into a battle unprepared. There's, there's not a, a team that's ever won the uh, World Series or the Super Bowl or even the Stanley Cup. I'm not sure what the Stanley Cup is. It has something to do with ice and hot, a disc and stuff. But anyway, there's none that have won any of those without training and preparation for the contest. You and I, we live our lives during the times of uh, relative peace, during, during, during times of calmness. Guys, that's what is going to determine whether or not we stand during times of conflict. As the word of the Lord tells us and, uh, through Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah chapter 12, the Lord tells us, if you've run with the footmen and they've wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the floodplain of the Jordan? In other words, if you're not being strengthened during this time in your life, you're never going to make it when the real attack of the enemy comes. If you're not growing in your faith right now to be able to stand whatever situations are happening in, in a relative calmness, you will never be able to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus when the attack of the enemy comes. Our current faithful obedience, that's what makes our foundation firm and strong. Firm and strong to be able to withstand the most violent of attacks. Even Jesus taught his followers, again, uh, teaching those that would come to him what it means and how to be able to stand against the storms. He shares with them, we find it in Matthew chapter 7. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 7. I want you to see this one for yourself. Matthew chapter 7, and look down beginning in verse 24. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 24. Jesus teaching his disciples, he says to them, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, in other words, your faithful obedience, you hear my teachings and you do them. Jesus says, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house. And it did not fall. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. Because they heard the sayings, they were faithful and obedient to do the sayings before the storm came. But look at the next character in verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a, what kind of a man, church? A foolish man who built his house on the sand. He's heard the word, but he is not faithful, nor is he obedient to follow the word that he knows. And Jesus likens him to be a foolish man. So he builds his house on the sand. And you know what? The same rain that was hitting the other house hits this one. The same floods come, the same winds blow, and they beat upon that house. And Jesus says, but that house fell, and great was its fall. Well, Jesus is telling them and what he tells you and I right now. Our current life of obedience and faithfulness is building a strong foundation against all future attacks of the enemies. Without consistent obedience, we have no reliable stability within our lives. The enemy doesn't have to send a strong wind. He can be like that wolf, just huff and puff, and he blows your house down. Why? Because you have no foundation. Because there's not obedience in your life. There's not been a faithfulness in your walk. There's no strength in your life at all. Without consistent obedience, we can't even begin to hope to stand against the attack of the enemy. If our hope is not anchored solidly in Christ and in the Word of God, in our faithful obedience to it, guys, we will be destroyed. You will be destroyed in the midst of the slightest battle. Edward Mote was born in London, January 1797. His parents owned and managed a pub and 
more often than not, they left Edward, even as a young child, to just fend for himself playing out in the streets of London. As Moat recalls his earlier years, he, he, he tells us that, again, about his childhood. He says, I was so ignorant that I didn't even know that there was a God. When he was finally exposed to the gospel message, he came to a saving faith in Christ. He was baptized about the age of 18, but he was trained as a cabinet maker, and he worked as a cabinet maker in and around London for the next 37 years. It wasn't until his 50s, when he was in his age range of the 50s, that he actually entered into the ministry and became pastor of a church in West Sussex. And he pastored that church then for another 26 years. He was so liked by the congregation that they offered him the church building as a gift. But Moat replied to them, I don't want the chapel. I only want the pulpit. And when I cease to preach Christ, then turn me out of that. The thing that Mode is really known for is some of the hymns that he wrote. He didn't write that many, but one in particular that's fairly well known. Probably many of you will know it. One of the verses of that hymn, he speaks of his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in that whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and my stay. Another verse that goes with that. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Sound like a familiar hymn to you? He says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteous, not my righteousness, that's an edit problem I forgot to fix last night. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Oh, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Guys, the Apostle Paul didn't write those words, but I believe that he lived them. He lived them fully. In the midst of all the attacks of the enemy, all the fears even within his own life, He continued to stay secure in the firm foundation of his faith in Christ. Close this morning with these words. The last words of this section that we're looking at this morning. Verse 15, back in Acts 21. Luke writes the simplicity of these words, but there is a volume to be declared in these words. Verse 15, after those days, we packed and we went up to Jerusalem. Paul understanding and knowing all that he was going to go through, all that was before him, yet he was faithful in obedience because he had been found faithful and obedient. The Lord was able to use him because he was a faithful servant, an obedient servant, because he trusted in the Lord, because he had that ever-growing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. My prayer for you this morning is that we would have that continual growth in our relationship with Christ. Hey, thanks for watching and listening to the current series. We're glad that the Lord is blessing you with this teaching. As you continue on in the teaching of the Word of God in your life, we pray that the Holy Spirit might take that Word, plant it deep within your heart and life, that you might see the fruit of God's love, the reality of His presence, and the power of His Spirit working in your life.